Great. Um, I'm Joanna Baker and uh, Linda Landry and I are hosting the meeting tonight and I will be um, introducing uh, Caitlin Smith and her talk on um, the conservation of the Arlington National Cemetery and the centennial of the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier. Caitlin Smith is the conservation program manager and conservator at Army National Military Cemeteries, Arlington National Cemetery and Soldiers and Airmen's Home National Cemetery focused on the preservation and rehabilitation of 19th through 21st century historic structures, commemorative works and artifacts. Prior to this, she worked for several private conservation firms. Caitlin holds an MS in historical preservation from the University of Pennsylvania and a BA in historic preservation and political science from the University of Mary Washington. She is a professional associate of the American Institute for Conservation and she is based in Arlington, Virginia. We welcome Caitlin. And if you have any questions for Caitlin, if you could hold them to the end and, or, or start putting them in the chat and I will, um, I will read them at the end. Great, welcome Clayton, Caitlin. Thank you, Joanna. All right, so hopefully everybody can see uh, my PowerPoint there. Well, thank you all for joining us. Um, I really appreciate the opportunity to speak with you all. Um, as Joanna said, I'm going to speak to you about Arlington National Cemetery, which is part of the unceded land of the Nacoshtank, Anacostan, and Piscataway. I would like to acknowledge the Nacoshtank, Anacostan, and Piscataway community and pay my respects to their past, present, and future elders. Uh, so I am Caitlin. I am the Conservation Program Manager. Uh, and uh, Joanna already introduced our topic. I will be discussing uh, the building of the ANMC conservation program over the last two years and what it's like to be a preservationist working on a site with multiple missions. Arlington National Cemetery is many things all at once, an army installation, a public site, a National Register historic site, an active cemetery, an arboretum, a tourist attraction, a stop for national and foreign dignitaries, host to ceremonies and events, a sacred space for families and friends of those who served, and an American national shrine. I'll also discuss the program's current projects with a special focus on the conservation efforts related to the upcoming centennial of the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier in November 2021. So let's start with why I get the privilege of speaking with you all tonight. Um, one, I think people were curious who got the job as the first conservator working for Arlington. And two, um, I'm speaking to you at a very exciting time for the cemetery. Last year, we celebrated the centennial of the Memorial Amphitheater. And this year, in just one month, we will be celebrating the centennial of the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier. So let's begin with why these two cemeteries might need a conservation program. I suspect many of you, if not all, are familiar with the cemeteries. Um, maybe you visited with a group, participated in Wreaths Then, or watched one of the major national commemorative events, such as Veterans Day or Memorial Day. Maybe you've been to a funeral service or have a loved one at the cemetery. Arlington is at its core an active cemetery and an active place of remembrance. The site conducts up to 30 funerals a day, Monday through Sunday, Saturday, year round. Um, what I think fewer of us may think about are all of the site's other functions. The site is a federally run army installation, and as I said, a National Register site since 2014, a level three arboretum, and uh, hosts to many dignitaries and events in addition to being a sacred space. So the cemetery staff, uh, like myself, must balance all of these missions um, and their related audiences while still maintaining the integrity of the primary mission, which is honoring and laying to rest America's veterans. And you may have caught a few times I've mentioned that we have two cemeteries. Um, that's why I'm calling it Army National Military Cemeteries, plural. Um, the first and the most uh, well-known obviously is Arlington National Cemetery, which is, was established in 1864. It's around 639 acres and expanding. The photo on the left is of our recent groundbreaking of our southern expansion. 
Uh, then there's the older of our two cemeteries, the United States Soldiers and Airmen's Home National Cemetery, established in 1861, which is around only 16 acres, so much smaller, and that's located in Washington, D.C. And there's a picture uh, from the cemetery on the right. So tonight, I don't want to diminish the site's primary mission. And in fact, we will be talking about one of the most famous burials later in the evening. But as a preservationist and a conservator, and considering tonight's audience, I do want to highlight the site's long history and how a conservation program fits within the ANMC mission. And this site, the land we work on, really does have a complex history, um, one that most of us may not think about. Uh, so let's start with how the land has really changed and evolved over time. This valuable plot of land, um, speaking primarily of the Arlington Cemetery, rests along the Potomac River, and as I mentioned, was inhabited by the Nacotchtank, Anacostan, and Piscataway communities. I encourage you, if you have a big enough screen, to zoom in on Mr. John Smith's map of the region, which is on the left. By around 1669, the land had been colonized, first by John Alexander. He got about 6,000 of these acres, passed on in 1778 to John Park Custis. He got 1,100 of these acres. And when he died, the land was placed in trust for his son, you may recognize the name, George Washington Park Custis. George was largely raised by his grandparents, you may also be familiar with, George and Martha Washington. But at the time the military laid claim to the land, it was during the Civil War, shown in the image on the right. And it belonged at that time to Mary Custis, married to another famous historical figure, Mr. General Robert E. Lee. And it was during this Union occupation in 1864 that Arlington National Cemetery was established as a military cemetery on about 210 acres of Mary Custis Lee's 1100-acre Arlington Estate. After the end of the Civil War, the Arlington Estate was used as a cemetery, a military camp, and a resettlement area for freedmen, uh, and an image of that is pictured on the left. The land then went through dramatic changes again in the 20th century as DC developed into an international capital. ANC reflected this with the construction of the Memorial Amphitheater. Then with the installation of the Tomb of the Unknowns, placed at ANC in 1921, uh, we really emphasized the memorial nature and the, uh, the national nature of the cemetery. Then with the construction of Arlington Memorial Bridge in 1932, we were no longer just figuratively tied, but physically connected to the monumental core of the city. And the photo on the right is um, after, not long after the construction of the Moore Amphitheater. Uh, and at this point, so we've made it to the 1930s, uh, the cemetery hasn't reached its current size yet. Um, we didn't own all the lands to the east, the lands closest to the Potomac River. Uh, were occupied by the U.S. Department of Agriculture. They ran an experimental farm from about 1901 to 1941. Then that land um, from about 1941 to 1966 got used for the World War II expansion of Fort Myer named South Post. So there is an image on the left of South Post. Um, we are still connected to the joint base at the top of the hill, joint base Meyer Henderson Hall. That's where all the regimental units come down from for the ceremonies, including the old guard, who we'll be talking about um, later. Um, and then uh, back to the cemetery. I'm certain many of you are aware that the death of President John F. Kennedy in 1963 and the subs subsequent construction of the monument and the internal flame on his grave site in 1967 greatly increased the cemetery's profile and popularity. And with that, uh, that is a brief run through the history books, very brief. Um, but I hope it gives you an idea of some of the many stories we're trying to preserve at Arlington. Uh, the cemetery has some remnants of all these different eras, in addition to the monuments and markers we may be more familiar with. So let's talk about um, those monuments and structures and markers. Our cultural resource management program, uh, run by Ms. Rebecca L. Stevens, um, it currently tracks around 308 historic structures within the two cemeteries. These are two examples on this slide. Uh, you've got the USS Maine Memorial on the left, which overlooks the remains of those who died when the ship exploded off the coast of Havana, Cuba in 1898. 
uh, significant for a number of reasons, including it marks the U.S. entry into the Spanish-American War, in addition to a rise in American nationalism and the beginning of the U.S. as an international power. On the right, you see an older structure, the Tanner Amphitheater. It was the site of the first Memorial Day ceremony in 1868, uh, originally called Decoration Day. The annual event became a major National Day of Remembrance, changing once again the trajectory and increasing the profile of both the, of the cemetery as it became the center of this national event. Um, the rehabilitation of both of these structures was undertaken, as I said, by our cultural resource manager, Rebecca Stevens. I'm gonna say her name a lot. Um, you may hear a little noise. Somebody just came in. <laughs> so. Um, so these two structures uh, were done, um, rehabilitated in partnership with the National Park Service, um, specifically the Historic Preservation Training Center. I believe some of those folks may be called in. So hello, thank you. Um, and I, what you can see from these two is that much of our work at the cemetery these days focuses on preservation and rehabilitation of 19th through 21st century historic structures, commemorative, commemorative works, and artifacts. Um, and then, as I noted, we track around 308 historic structures. Uh, what this number does not include is the private and government markers, things uh, most of us are familiar with the cemeteries. So get ready for some big numbers. At Arlington, there are around 267,000 markers, government and private, and we'll talk about that later, and around 400,000 burials, and obviously constantly increasing. So um, that's a lot of objects and stories to keep track of. In addition, the cemetery does maintain a small objects collection and archive managed by our great installation historians and curator. Uh, much of the objects collection really consists of gifts given by visiting dignitaries. So um, a unique collection. So with such a rich history, it's no surprise um, that Arlington National Cemetery joined the National Register of Historic Places in 2014. And uh, that's the environment I stepped into in the summer of 2019 as the first conservation program manager for the cemeteries. Um, the groundwork was really already laid um, by the cultural resources program, the engineering program, the history office. Um, and again, I'll give lots of credit to Rebecca Stevens for convincing the organization that there was a particular skill set they'd like to have in house. So let's talk about the conservation program um, and how it fits into this well-established organization. Uh, the cemeteries, which are both army installations, have an engineering department that includes within it a variety of branches, design and construction, facilities maintenance, horticulture, and planning and resources. My program falls within planning and resources, uh, which includes a master planner, a real property accountable officer, an environmental compliance manager, and a uh, cultural resources program manager and myself. So our team sort of serves as specialists, providing assistance, guidance, compliance on a wide range of construction and maintenance projects primarily, in addition to running our own projects. And uh, I have to say the engineering department is a very busy one. Uh, the team manages a wide range of projects covering anything uh, from turf renovation and planting, Lots of road milling and repaving, um, abatement of structures, disposal of soils, hazardous waste removal, ADA improvements, uh, construction of new structures like the Southern Expansion, and uh, rehabilitation and even occasionally reconstruction of historic structures. And these are just a couple of lovely images showing the engineering team at work. As I've noted, uh, adding a new program into a well-established system can have its challenges. Luckily, there was plenty of support and interest from the engineering team and a long wish list of program capabilities. Um, on the other hand, uh, most of the team had not worked directly with a conservator before, and uh, we're still continuing to establish the ways in which uh, the program engages with staff, departments, and projects. At the start in 2019, uh, the program had only one thing, me. Uh, we didn't have yet any policies or procedures to rely on. Um, there's no army regulations directly regarding uh, conservation, historic preservation. Uh, well, there are for historic preservation, but that is uh, for Rebecca's program, uh, cultural resource management. Um, otherwise I had no materials, equipment, no facilities yet. Uh, sharing with, with the others. Um, probably also didn't help that I was a new federal employee, also new to the Department of Defense and the army. 
So lots of uh, room to learn and grow. So obviously one of the first things we had to do was define the program and distill what the program's mission would be. Um, SCOPE is obviously allied with the cultural resources program and, and similar, um, but I would say our, our CRM uh, works a little bit more with the regulations and requirements and obviously manages our 106 reviews of projects. And I focus a little bit more on materials and design of interventions and treatments and occasional implementation of treatments. Um, so my mission statement in general, the conservation program makes decisions regarding intervention and treatment for historical buildings, structures, objects, art, and landscapes within the ANC and SAHNC properties. We assist with construction, maintenance, preservation, and any tasks related to the two cemeteries historical physical infrastructure. We produce assessments, research, documentation, planning, consultation, review, EMPs, SOPs, scopes of work, budgets, and uh, provide technical expertise, project management, uh, occasionally contract management and oversight, training and implementation of treatments. And uh, we develop conservation treatments specific to ANC's needs by researching, evaluating, testing, and collaborating on existing treatments and developing new treatments and interventions. Also, the program performs education and outreach, disseminating information to staff, partners, and the public. Sounds good. So we have a mission statement, pretty broad. Um, now we need to decide uh, how we're going to accomplish that mission. So we started small, we started slow. Um, first, there was a lot of trust building. Uh, it can be hard to insert a new program into a well-established organizational structure. And I will be honest, I took a few blows to the heart um, when folks in other programs would tell me, I like you, no offense to you, but why do we need a conservator? We were doing just fine before you got here. I heard that more than once. <laughs> so I definitely felt the need to prove myself. Um, it's a different environment than when I worked in private practice, though uh, plenty of the challenges uh, remind me of the same ones we fail faced when working on construction sites with contractors and maybe more traditional fields. Um, so we drew upon those experiences, tried to listen to those who've been working at ANMC long before me, and uh, attempted to draw people into conservation projects and to share, share knowledge, materials, swap stories. And uh, when I could, prove my usefulness. So um, I would occasionally review and provide products to interment services and interment operations, um, such as when they were looking at headstone cleaning products. Um, when somebody smears lip gloss on a wall, I would be there to remove it. Um, if uh, events wanted a monument clean before wreath laying, Often I'd get moved to the top of the list. Um, or if the history office really wanted to open a hundred year old memorabilia box, um, we freaked out a little bit. And then we grabbed our toolbox and, uh, and got to it. So um, speaking of that memorabilia box, um, I was pretty lucky to inherit a number of interesting projects that have mostly been run by the cultural resources program and even the history office. Um, so I think I mentioned last year, our Memorial Amphitheater celebrated its centennial in 2020. Um, we'll show a little bit of those projects a little bit later. Um, also the Memorial, uh, so related to that, the Memorial Amphitheater um, masonry repairs occurred over the last two years, as did the biofilm treatment, which will again be talked about a little bit later. Um, those were already planned. You'll get to see some of that in a short video we're gonna show. Um, but uh, while I'm talking about it, I, uh, I would be remiss if I didn't say um, that that was a huge and really interesting project, the biofilm treatment. Um, a multi-year effort by Rebecca Stevens and Judy Jacob from the National Park Service. And they did some really bold things with some really simple materials um, that are having some big effects. So I'll be excited to show you that later. Um, and then another project, obviously, I got lucked into was uh, the one we've been waiting for, the one we're going to talk about last, the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier Centennial. Um, oh, and since I was talking about biofilm, that is what the picture on the left is of, that is both the tomb and treatment of biofilm with uh, zinc oxide. We'll, we'll talk about that. And then on the right is some of that um, uh, jumping into action and some, tr and some trust building, uh, working on um, what I tend to refer to as the Binny Ream statue uh, at the Binny Ream uh, and the Hoxie grave site. 
All right, so we're back to the program. Um, so now we had some big ideas and big projects to accomplish. So uh, we knew we needed to build up our team. Um, from a program of one with lots of support from others, um, but uh, the program needed to get a little bit bigger. So we ended up utilizing our existing partnership with the National Park Service Historic Preservation Training Center uh, or HPTC. Again, hi guys. Um, to add some additional power to the conservation program, the Cultural Resources Program had already utilized a couple of interns every other year to do um, a thorough survey of all our historic resources and their current conditions. Um, so we utilized that in 2020. So last summer, we inaugurated our first conservation uh, NICP, National Council of Preservation Education intern team. And so I'll take a minute to thank uh, Jennifer Boggs and Katie Lear Laird for being our first interns. Um, who worked in a very bare bones operation and did a really great job. Um, this year, we were lucky enough um, to again work with HPTC, but this time we utilized instead of NICP, their traditional trades apprenticeship program, uh, and, which was then administered through Conservation Legacy to expand the conservation internship program to four interns per six months. So for six months out of the year, um, I got to uh, really, <laughs> quadruple the size of the, the uh, conservation program. And in case they're listening, um, I would like to thank the current batch of interns, um, Megan Timmons, Elizabeth O'Meara, Shay Robinson, and James Lorenzen for all their hard work these last couple of months. And uh, when they do leave me, I'll be very sad, but anyone on the call who would like to hire them, I will gladly give them a recommendation. <laughs> um, so this year, uh, ANMC is also investing in a dedicated space for the conservation program. Uh, so that's what you're seeing on the right. Um, on the left, those were two of our interns from last summer, that is Jen and Katie. On the right, um, this is our new space, our new old space. Um, so we'll be moving into the northern end of the historic receiving vault, uh, which is going to expand our capacity to do in-house work for the two cemeteries. Um, and then uh, in the future, in addition to uh, probably hanging on to the internship program, we'll hope to establish some, uh, some more comprehensive contracts to help with maintenance of all our historic structures. Hopefully we're gonna get going an IDIQ contract for annual maintenance of memorials and monuments and to assist with emergency conservation treatments. And with that, with these things in place, um, the conservation program has been gradually able to accomplish more and more in-house work. And I am admittedly biased, um, but I hope and believe that having a conservation program at ANMC has expanded the organization's ability to address issues faster, to fill gaps in contracts, um, to be better able to review contractor work, be it documentation or in the field. So for example, um, top left, uh, this was an example of where we already had a large masonry project going on at the Memorial Amphitheater. And, uh, we needed to reassess some areas and add some scope to the contract. So uh, the intern and I got up on the scaffolding and did some inspections of the building. Um, on the top right, it's an example of some training we were able to provide the cemetery staff. This was a um, masonry training exercise, um, doing some patching and repairs. Uh, on the bottom left, or the entire bottom, the slide. Um, this is a recent project with this year's batch of interns. Um, we are very excited to be reconstructing in the near future uh, the Ord Wetzel Gate. It used to be one of the primary entrances to the cemetery on our northeastern border. Um, but as expansion happened and uh, we switched from, you know, carriages to larger trucks, um, the gate was taken down and had been sitting for a while in pieces and, uh, and uh, in the next year, it's going to get reconstructed. So uh, long story short, um, the contract was well underway for this project, but uh, the stones had been sitting, they had been repaired, but they've been sitting in a yard for a while. So the interns and I um, undertook some masonry repairs that uh, weren't currently under contract to make sure the stones would be ready for reconstruction. And that's what you're seeing on the bottom. You're seeing them uh, cleaning up the stones, um, doing some grouting and patching and uh, lime washing. Here's some other uh, a variety of standard monument work, monument uh, rehabilitation and maintenance. 
Um, this was the, you've got the Tomb of the Remembrance ossuary cleaning, um, the Pierre Charles L'Enfant Memorial cleaning. Uh, we've got on the bottom the um, Armored Forces Memorial, some stain reduction, and the 101st Airborne on Memorial Avenue, one of our newer monuments since uh, Congress decided to give the cemetery a chunk of Memorial Avenue recently. Uh, we've uh, added some additional land and so a few more monuments. Um, some other small projects uh, on everything on the left is a variety of bronze work that the interns this summer have been undertaking um, with some of our expanded capacity. And on the right is one of those few um, uh, and unfortunate uh, vandalism events, minor, um, but something that uh, handy, I would hope, to have a conservation program to uh, address those in a timely fashion. All right. So um, that's a bit about the program. I will, and I will say for myself along the way, uh, there have been um, many surprises and lots of learning opportunities. Um, and then I, I wanna share some of these with you guys. Uh, for one, it's interesting to work in a federal secular army installation, but it's one that's also considered an American national shrine and a sacred site. Um, you know, this terminology is normally reserved for religious sites. Um, here, among other things, it's a reminder that this is a highly visible and emotionally charged site. Um, any projects we undertake uh, must be done with sensitivity to the vast array of individuals and groups who have emotional ties to this site and what it represents for each of them. Second, there are sometimes differences in philosophy and restrictions on what we can and cannot touch. Um, I don't know what you guys think of the site. Um, I think sometimes I took it for granted that everything within the ANC Historic District would be maintained by a &MC staff, um, but there are actually many markers and monuments that we don't have the authority to work on. Um, when you think of ANC, maybe you picture what you see on the left, um, those iconic rows of marble markers where all veterans of all backgrounds are symbolically equalized. Um, these are all federally funded government markers. A and MC budgets for the maintenance of marble markers. They're all the same material, the same style, the same height, all as uniform as possible. And then look at the section uh, that's on the far right. There are a number of cemetery sections, particularly in the older areas, full of privately funded private markers. And you can see all the diversity there. Um, we don't have the authority to maintain these the same way we do as the government markers. Um, when a family decides to install a private marker, they're really signing up to take responsibility for the marker in perpetuity. Of course, as the user, excuse me, of course, as the years go by, it can be harder and harder to contact family members, especially when we're talking about a marker from maybe the 1870s. Nonetheless, uh, the family next of kin are the only ones who can authorize repairs. In addition, uh, the cemetery doesn't have federal funds to cover the thousands of unique private markers, which again are fairly diverse. Uh, there's a lot of granite, but there are boulders, there are obelisks, um, marble, granite, sandstone, limestone, concrete, bronze, uh, and they can range in size from a simple flat marker that's maybe 24 inches by 12 inches to maybe a 20 foot tall obelisk topped with a delicately carved angel. Um, it's a problem familiar to many cemeteries, um, but perhaps a, a higher profile one at a site that's known as a national shrine. And I'd also like to remind you of the cemetery's mission. Um, a and MC exists to honor and remember those who served and are laid to rest within our bounds. As a result, the general philosophy regarding grave markers is that, is that they must be legible and accurate. Um, if they're not, you're not properly honoring that person uh, and it should be corrected. So occasionally this might mean that we would replace an old and illegible marker, regardless of the age. also means we might have hard conversations when one of these private markers, uh, like we see here in section one, is damaged. When, when Mother Nature fells a tree in section one, we have to determine what actions we can and cannot take. Um, we reach out to the next of kin if we can get in touch with them. Um, and in the case of the monument pictured above, if the most important thing is that the grave is marked and we don't have the authority or funds for repairs, 
we may not reconstruct what's broken. All right. And with that, I'm going to change uh, topics a little bit. I'm going to shift to the main event. Um, now that you're intimately acquainted with the cemetery, and with the conservation program, um, I'm going to focus now um, on what we've been working really hard on the last couple of years. Um, the engineering team and the conservation program included have been uh, hard at work throughout the pandemic to prepare, to prepare for the Tomb of the Unknown Centennial in November. Um, so I'm really excited to share with you the team's hard work. Ah, here's where I'm gonna have technical difficulties, I'm sure. Um, so if you don't mind, um, I don't like watching myself speak, but I'd like to try to show you this video um, because it'll have some more action and it'll get you to see the team uh, at work. Um, might as well take advantage of the fact that we're on Zoom. So let's see if I cannot mess this up. Um, I'm gonna switch, I'm gonna share again. Here we go. For 100 years, Arlington National Cemetery staff have worked to carefully maintain and preserve the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier, ensuring that future generations can pay their respects at the same monument that so many have for the last 100 years. The tomb centennial commemoration will occur this November, just three months away. In preparation for this significant milestone, the Arlington National Cemetery cultural resources, conservation, and engineering teams have been working diligently to rehabilitate and conserve both the tomb and the Memorial Amphitheater. Amidst the COVID-19 pandemic, we carried out approximately 20 projects now in various stages of completion. The rehabilitation projects include the application of zinc oxide, the removal of stains on the plaza, the rehabilitation of ledger stones by the National Park Service, rehabilitation of the wood windows and doors, as well as repairs to the granite and marble. Maintaining these resources requires our team to blend old technologies with new ones to preserve the physical and intangible character of the tomb. One of the most innovative treatments we're using is the application of a zinc oxide coating to the exterior marble of Memorial Amphitheater and the tomb, a project that was six years in the making. In 2014, our cultural resource management program started examining the issue of biofilm at Arlington in partnership with the National Park Service. The biofilm layer, consisting of a complex community of microorganisms, darkens the marble surfaces of the amphitheater and the tomb. Cleaning tests on the amphitheater led to five years of observation, monitoring, and documenting the biofilm reduction on the marble. To the test areas, we applied widely used conservation and household cleaning products abraded the marble with laser light, and coated it with zinc oxide, all while monitoring each method's performance on the stone over time. After extensive study, the application of zinc oxide was determined to be the most effective, environmentally safe, low cost, and gentlest treatment method. In the summer of 2019, cemetery staff applied the zinc oxide mixture to selected marble surfaces on the amphitheater and the tomb. This treatment had never been used before on such a large scale, and its goal is to slowly lighten the color of the biofilm, which will be noticeable 12 to 15 months after application, renewing the overall white appearance of the marble. Last year, in preparation for the Memorial Amphitheater's 100th anniversary, many efforts were taken to preserve and improve the amphitheater in its surrounding areas. Particularly, where the tomb is located on the amphitheater's east plaza, rehabilitation was completed of the historic finish on the bronze railings, as well as a resetting and cleaning the pavers and upgrades to the Sentinel's box. Last year, the three marble ledger stones received extensive conservation treatments. Showing severe discoloration and surface damage, the conservation team undertook stain reduction cleaning, and Mason, specializing in historic preservation, carefully installed 10 marble Dutchmen to make the ledgers whole and sound again. At this point, it has been almost nine years since the tomb last received conservation treatments. Currently, we are working on performing preservation maintenance to install new mortar in the joints, regrout the cracks, reattach loose fragments, and document current conditions. Our conservation team also performs routine preservation maintenance on a variety of objects and monuments through our two national cemeteries. This includes cleaning and repair of masonry, reduction of staining, in-painting, repatination, waxing, and lacquering of bronzes, architectural investigations, headstone rehabilitation, basic object care, and documentation of historic resources. Arlington staff worked throughout the year to maintain the objects and structures within our National Historic District. 
These smaller scale projects are often less visible, but they also demonstrate our conviction to maintain all aspects of our historic site. Part of Arlington's mission is to maintain and care for this national shrine, ensuring that the public can continue to visit, explore, mourn, and celebrate in this sacred space for generations to come. Members of the cultural resources, conservation, and engineering teams preserve not only the cemetery's physical structures, but the ideals they stand for. The tomb began as a national project and remains one to this day. The Arlington National Cemetery staff who care for the monument ensure its legacy will continue for years to come. All right. Thank you all. Uh, if anyone can just confirm that you can hear me. We can hear you. Great, thank you. Um, so I'm sorry if that was a little fuzzy and laggy. Never, never know with technology. Um, that video is on YouTube if you really would like to check it out yourself. Um, but that gives you a sense of some of the things we've been working on. And, uh, and now I'm going to show you in a little bit more detail Assuming this slide changes. There it goes. All right. Um, so, as we mentioned in the video, we began with the Memorial Amphitheater Centennial last year. Um, it included masonry repairs, uh, the addition of an ADA ramp, which is just finishing now, and uh, that biofilm treatment with zinc oxide that was covered a fair bit in the video there. Um, it also included uh, the removal and opening of that memorabilia box that I mentioned. Um, this was a, a project the historians were very excited about, especially my friend Tim Frank, um, who really spearheaded this. Um, so what you're seeing pictures of right there are the actual opening of the cornerstone in the amphitheater and the removal of the memorabilia box. Uh, they weren't called time capsules yet. Um, and then uh, on the right, uh, there's me trying to have a peek inside um, after I've cut a little hole um, into what's in the box. Uh, so that was a big project last year in the middle of the pandemic, hence the, uh, the dust mask, not just for my safety from, <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, that, that was quite a thing. Um, yeah, it, it, was, um, it was quite a thing to have to, to help open that. Um, this is the moment where I actually got to see inside on the left there. Um, and then uh, after we opened this and we took out all the objects and documented them all, um, on the right, I got to help make a new time capsule, one that uh, will help hopefully also last 100 years and outlive me, um, outlive potentially all of us <laughs> on this call. Um, and uh, yeah, being my first time capsule project, it was admittedly strange to put together something that I knew I would not likely see opened and I would just have to hope I really did everything right. <laughs> but we tried really hard. <laughs> um, so there is the new time capsule on the right um, with all the objects being carefully packaged and, uh, and put inside. So that was one of our projects. Um, so the other ones also mentioned in the video, again, the bronze railings, the interns did, that's the top left. Um, the zinc oxide, some of that we did ourselves in house. Uh, some of it, especially the high access stuff, we did contract out. Um, and we had to do that far in advance. Um, what Judy Jacob and Rebecca Stevens uh, figured out in all their work studying um, this possible treatment for biofilm was that uh, while it is cheap and effective, it is not fast. So um, uh, that was all put on 2020. And I'll say the building looks uh, really good, really good right now. It, after a year, um, in some places, almost two years, uh, it, it's really been effective at reducing that dark staining. Biofilm is still there, it's still everywhere. And that's a whole nother talk. And Rebecca and Judy have a really good one about it. Um, uh, but uh, we did effectively reduce the, the black pigmentation. So it's been really great. And it's been really gentle for the building. Um, the uh, images on bottom also tied to the centennial uh, just down the 
the plaza um, down the grand promenade from the tomb is the Roosevelt Fountain, um, which had gotten a lot of rust staining. So we did some stain reduction on that. Um, also near the Memorial Amphitheater in the tomb is this um, commemorative, this Woodhull flagpole. So we did some rehabilitation on that, poulticing and stain reduction and bronze treatment. Um, you saw it in the video that may have been blurry. Uh, so here's a, a hopefully a sharper image of that uh, tomb stain reduction. I, I would, I'm breathing past some of the details on the tomb to talk about the conservation program, um, but uh, hopefully you all know there are actually uh, three ledger stones and one tomb, all two unknowns, um, but from different wars. Uh, so what you're seeing are the, this is one of the flat marble ledger stones, um, and it's one of the stones we did some stain reduction on, and we're going to talk a little bit in, a, in just a little bit about why it maybe is that stain. Um, also on the bottom, again, shout out to the Historic Preservation Training Center. Um, some of the Masons last year, um, we did take advantage of the pandemic a little. You saw in the video, we actually were able to work on the plaza during the day. We'll talk about how rare that is um, during the pandemic because we were open. We were still doing funerals, but we were, uh, we were not letting general public in. And uh, when we did, we were much reduced and we were not letting people um, come onto the plaza while the construction was ongoing. So we really took advantage of that to do the work on the exterior of the Memorial Amphitheater, lots of lifts driving around, and also on the plaza. And so uh, again, on the bottom left, you're seeing the HPTC Park Service um, masons uh, doing Dutchman repairs. There were about 10 we had done on the uh, two of the three marble ledger stones. Um, and they did, a, I think, a really great job making these whole again, because um, there's there uh, is often the possibility in the real world, um, and especially in an environment where we want things to be um, clean and shiny, uh, and uh, honoring, uh, we want to be honoring those um, who have served as best we can. We always talk about possibly replacing things that don't look up to snuff. Um, so it was really great to um, make these stones whole again. Um, and I think from a distance, you you. They did a really great job blending the repairs. You can't really tell they're there. Uh, on the right um, was another little project related to the Centennial and uh, the tomb guards who work on the plaza guarding the tombs. Uh, this is their guard booth, their box. Um, it is bronze uh, frame and it is has been there a very long time. Um, and so uh, facilities and the metal shop, um, did some repairs, especially to the innards. It's got all new shiny electronics inside. Um, my portion was to help work with the facilities team and train them up on some bronze repairs and bronze treatment because um, we did this after the entrance had left. And uh, so those are some facilities folks up top um, doing um, some patination and, uh, and then you can see the before and after of the box with its new um, new cover on its new interior and it's a uh, lacquered bronze finish. Um, so I, I teased this one a little. Um, this is um, this is the plaza and these are the tombs if you were not aware. Um, maybe many of you have visited and seen these or if you haven't visited you've probably seen them on television at some point especially since um, this is where for Veterans Day and Memorial Day usually we get some high profile visitors. Um, this is going to be the focal point of the centennial next month. Um, this one I'm teasing because I'm, I'm pausing on this one because for me, it's an example of, um, how we deal with, um, unique challenges and, uh, different stakeholders at the cemetery. Um, so I think most of you on this call probably know that conservation and preservation don't occur in a vacuum. Um, one of the factors we take into account before deciding on a course of treatment are who are the stakeholders in the community associated with the object. Um, and at cemeteries, this can include groups with intense emotional connections to the site. Uh, at ANC, um, you know, we've got the public, the family members and loved ones, the veterans. Um, and for this project, one of the groups we consulted with regularly is the old guard, um, the sentinels who walk the plaza. Um, 
So real quick about the guard. In uh, 1926, soldiers from nearby Fort Myer were first assigned to guard the tomb. And uh, at that time, they were only there during daylight. They just kept people from getting too close to the tomb because it really, you could walk right up to it then. Um, in, and then the tomb wasn't as large. Uh, in 37, they became a 24 seven presence, um, standing watch over the tomb all at all times. Um, and this is the third US infantry regiment known as the Old Guard, the Honor Guard, the Sentinels. Um, they're the army's official ceremonial unit. They became such in 1948. Um, and again, they are now there 24 hours a day, 365 days a year, regardless of the weather. Um, so uh, why do I mention all this? These soldiers spend their days and nights with the tomb. Uh, they religiously study the history of the unit, the tomb the site, and each person dedicates themselves to the Guard of Honor mission. They keep a constant vigil at this national shrine and they must prevent any desecration or disrespect directed towards the tomb of the unknown soldier. Um, so, this project and, and the tomb project we're going to talk about um, are an example of the input of uh, those stakeholders affect projects. So on the left, you see our plaza covered in ferrous stains. These are likely caused by the steel tips, heel plates, and clickers on the guard's shoes. In preparation for the centennial, um, we wanted to implement some, uh, we wanted to clean up the plaza a little bit. Um, we wanted to balance the desire to clean it, give it a respectful, cared for appearance and to remove the ferrous staining, the iron particles, because they were visually disruptive um, and they were potentially causing staining damage to those three marble ledger stones, which are embedded in the plaza. Um, we also wanted to balance that with the desire not to erase history. Um, and we wanted to still leave some trace of where the guards walk. And they had a, a large concern um, that we might fully erase traces of that. Um, so in the end, uh, we did stain reduction, full scale. We did a lot of tests and mock-ups and showed them to the stakeholders. Um, and so we did leave some trace of the lines where the guards walk. Um, and at this point, we're not asking anybody to modify the steel shoes. Um, it, it could be a continuing discussion. Um, the stains are, are returning um, and we have to balance uh, you know, the needs of stakeholders, of the guards, um, with the need to preserve and protect those, uh, those tombs since they are of national significance and, um, and the whole reason the guard exists. Um, so those are some of the discussions we have when we uh, do even these simple, simple projects. Um, and then finally, real quick, <laughs> um, the project two years in the making, at, at least for me, um, for others, it may have been longer. Um, we undertook, the ANMC staff, the rehabilitation of the Tomb of the Unknown. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, so we began about two years before the centennial um, with the application of zinc oxide to the tomb's marble surfaces. This is actually from 2019. And if you look at the tomb, you can sort of see at the, the top on the capstone, sort of that grayish um, staining, that mottled appearance. Um, so, uh, again, this is a treatment I inherited um, that, uh, that others designed, but we applied zinc oxide uh, to those areas of biofilm on the tomb two years ago, knowing that it would take time and that we needed, we were hoping the tomb would look its best by uh, November next month. Um, so, um, we started with that. Um, as we, as we turn to the tomb, I guess I would be remiss if I didn't really quick um, talk about the tomb itself as an object. Um, I, I'm not gonna be discussing the entire history of the unknowns, their selection, or the first unknown ceremony held in November 11th, 1921. Um, these topics have been covered extensively and much better than I ever could by uh, the ANMC historians. And I'll point you to the excellent resources on our website, including the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier Education Program, the Tomb 100 resource page, and the monthly 2021 lecture series the historians have been conducting in partnership with the National World War I uh, Museum and Memorial, the National World War II Museum, the National Park Service, the Old Guard, the American Battle Monuments Commission, and the US National Archives and Records Administration. Instead, I'm gonna talk about the tomb more as a historic object, um, touching briefly on its design and construction and how we care for it today. Um, so quickly, um, when the design process for the Memorial Amphitheater began in 1908, uh, there were no plans for a tomb. 
But by the time construction completed in 1920, we had been through the First World War and there was a desire to honor American sacrifice with a tomb of a symbolic unknown, similar to the unknown burials that recently took place in France and Great Britain. The first American unknown was interred on Armistice Day, 1921, and the site was marked with a simple unadorned marble slab, uh, which you are seeing on the left. This was intended to become a pedestal for the later grander memorial, but it was replaced in 1931. The current permanent tomb, which you see being installed on the right, um, didn't complete until 1932. The winning design was of a simple white marble sarcophagus marked with columns and wreaths, Greek figures looking out on Washington, D.C., and the inscription, here rests an honored glory and an American soldier known but to God. The three Greek figures on the east are commemorative of the spirit of the Allies in the war, and the center stands victory, flanked by valor and peace and her palm branch and their symbols of devotion, sacrifice, and courage triumphant. Congress authorized an open design competition in 1926. By 1929, the Fine Arts Commission had selected architect Lorimer Rich and sculptor Thomas Hudson Jones from over 70 sculptors and architects to design this tomb. Together, these two veterans created the iconic tomb whose centennial we now celebrate. Um, the tomb is made up of about seven blocks of luminous white Colorado Yule marble, um, four blocks forming about a 15 ton subface, one for the 16 ton base or plinth, uh, one for the about 36 ton carved die block and a final about 12 ton block forming the cap. Um, at its highest point on the east, it's about 11 feet tall. It's about eight feet by 15 uh, at the widest point of base. Um, these were high quality blocks. It took many attempts to quarry them. Um, but uh, we should remember that these, these blocks that later became the tomb uh, did have to survive a long journey. They came across the entire United States pretty much, traveling from the Colorado quarry where they were extracted by train to Vermont to be sawn to final size and roughly fabricated. And again, they traveled by train to Arlington National Cemetery here in Virginia. With the marble in place, it remained only for the sculpting to be completed. The Piccarelli brothers completed the rough preparation of the pilasters and sculptures before the stones were set in place. Uh, you may know the Piccarelli brothers as an Italian family of renowned marble carver, carvers and sculptors who carved many significant sculptures in the United States, including Daniel Chester French's colossal Abraham Lincoln and the Lincoln Memorial. After the brothers completed their work, a shelter was built over the tomb so that Thomas Hudson Jones could complete the sculpting out of view from the public. And after he finished, uh, the brothers carved the inscription on the west. The tomb was then unveiled in April 9th, 1932. All right, and so then after construction, um, the, the maintenance began. This is always the case. Someone must maintain the things we built. Um, and it doesn't take long for there to be minor issues, you know, too hard a mortar, creating spalling. Um, and over time, cracks start to appear, develop. Um, so there have been many repair campaigns over the tomb over the years, um, not super frequent, but um, uh, uh, there, there have been several. Um, and, uh, and we continue that tradition. Um, last month, September uh, 2021, over the span of about a week, uh, the interns and I uh, undertook a number of uh, treatments. Um, we documented the tomb's current condition, including photography and measuring of any cracks. We removed existing grout from the cracks, replaced them with new grout, uh, removed existing mortar, replaced with mortar of the same type, we did some spot cleaning, zinc oxide, insect and debris removal, and reattached any loose fragments. Um, as you can see, all this work occurred after the cemetery's public visitation hours. Again, as a result of the discussion between the stakeholders, uh, the determination was made that due to both the tomb's sensitivity and to prevent any shutdown of the plaza or disruption of the ceremonies during the day, all the work on the tomb needed to occur outside of public hours. This also required honest discussions with the honor guard about the work and what it entails. Um, the sentinels themselves, they never touched the tomb, so they're highly sensitive to the idea of anyone else having contact with it. Appropriate procedures were put in place when working with the sacred and culturally sensitive object. This included um, regulating our staff's behavior, um, respectful rituals when entering and leaving the plaza, such as placing your hand over your heart, or if you're a veteran, saluting, um, or active duty, saluting, um, stepping off during guard changes, observing taps, um, 
and not including the, the sentinels in documentation without their permission. Um, so with these guide guidelines in place, the conservation team implemented our treatments. And, uh, and I've said this before, I can't take credit for the design of all the treatments. Um, we did make some modifications in modern habit adaptations, but much of the treatment replicates work that was performed in 2010 and 2011 by Worcester Eisenbrandt. And, um, and that last treatment ended up being a team effort, drawing on a panel of experts to design, some of whom may be on this uh, call, um, to design grouts and mortars that would be compatible with historic marble. The team included, among others, the Army Corps of Engineers and conservators and preservationists from the National Park Service Center, National Center for Preservation Technology and Training, the National Trust for Historic Preservation, the Virginia Department of Historic Resources, the American Institute for Conservation, and Columbia University. So here you can see uh, the current intern team and myself at work. Uh, we began with documenting the cracks, uh, as you can see on the top left. Um, cleaning the cracks, removing failed previous repair materials um, since it had been 10 years, um, uh, cleaning up the cracks uh, before we installed our new material. You can see the tomb looks a little scary once you clean out all the cracks. Um, and you'll see even better in the next slide, um, since we've highlighted them for you, um, we marked out the cracks. Um, with some low tack painters tape. Um, that there are two primary cracks. There's, there's some smaller cracks, but there are two primary cracks which are pretty well documented uh, around the tomb. Um, these have been extensively studied. Um, we just confirmed they hadn't changed much in the last 10 years. Um, so here you can see the team grouting the crack with a custom mix, uh, color matched where we could when possible. Um, it's a combination of marble dust, lime, a little bit of cement. Um, and then you can see the team applying a little bit of spot zinc oxide uh, to little spots of biofilm, um, reattaching loose fragments. And, uh, and then there's the team removing mortar and then regrouting and repointing. all with our headlamps on. <laughs> and here is the tomb uh, after completion. You can see some before and afters, especially in the middle of the, uh, the hopefully the crack is well hidden in the, the picture on the bottom. So <laughs> um, I would be remiss if I didn't say uh, to you all that in November, um, there are going to be several uh, days of events um, to commemorate the centennial of the tomb, and here's a brief summary of them. Um, there's some events at the Navy Yard. Um, the, one of the ones I want to highlight is that November 9th through 10th, that commemorative flower ceremony is taking place at the cemetery, and you can sign up for a slot. Uh, they are free. Um, but it's uh, one of the rare chances to walk on the plaza um, the public generally does not get to get this close to the tomb. So on those two days, the public will be allowed onto the plaza to lay a flower and pay their respects. Um, and then on November 11th, uh, there's going to be a joint procession and a flyover and uh, the uh, Armed Forces full honor wreath laying and a National Veterans Day observance. So I hope you will all um, participate in your own ways and join us. Otherwise, that is the end of my talk. Um, and I look forward to any questions we can squeeze in. <laughs> that was absolutely fascinating and really quite moving. We do have quite a few questions. Um, there are a lot of questions about the zinc oxide, but before we get to that, <laughs> um, there, someone had a question. Um, what do you use most frequently for stain reduction aside from the zinc oxide? Um, at this point, because the program is very new, I do use a lot of um, pre-made products, uh, especially because I'm doing largely outdoor large-scale monuments. So uh, there are a couple companies that make um, uh, cleaners specifically for historic masonry that we do tend to use 
Um, obviously, we use them after extensive testing, and we look carefully at the product data and the uh, pH of the products before we um, move ahead. Um, but we do use a lot of pre-mixed. Um, and, uh, and then there are a couple custom things we, now that we're better stocked, we're starting to do um, some thioglycolate and some other um, stain reduction materials. We mostly are dealing a lot with rust. There's a lot of rust and a lot of um, copper stains because uh, of um, bronzes that haven't been frequently maintained. Um, I can get into more detail if you like. I don't know that I want to get too specific into um, different companies. Yeah. Okay, so about the zinc oxide, there were several questions, as I said. Um, after applying the first time, how long does it last? And do you have to re reapply after a certain number of months or years? So here's where I admit there's a great research opportunity for someone who would like to partner <laughs> with us. Um, I will, again, give Judy Jacob, this is really her baby. Um, Judy uh, has been studying zinc oxide for a long time. She's very passionate about um, biofilms and their treatment and uh, whether we should or shouldn't clean and how um, and using more uh, gentler, um, less environmentally hazardous materials. So she had tested zinc oxide. You know, we knew things like zinc were biocidal, right? Um, that's why you find zinc strips on roofs. Um, we also know that zinc oxide, you may know it's in your sunscreen, right? It acts as a bit of a sunblock. Uh, so I think part of the, the thinking behind using it is that you're both getting a little bit of biocidal uh, and a little bit of um, a sunblock because really what we know from studying the biofilms is you never really get rid of them. You just modify them, you change them or different colonies take, uh, take over. So um, Judy studied this a lot. We also, she brought in um, a local high school, uh, the Thomas Jefferson High School um, for Science and Technology. I think I just butchered that. Um, it's a local high school and uh, they uh, have a, a really passionate teacher there who um, focused on this project and she she and her students would take samples periodically of the biofilms and then they would go back and they would look at um, what made them up. And uh, we're hoping as COVID ramps hopefully down that they will get to come back and do a new comparison because we've had lots of before sampling, but not as much after sampling uh, at this scale anyway. They did do sampling before and we are, again are pretty positive. Biofilms are always there. We've just modified them. And someday somebody will get really rich learning how to grow just the the biofilm we can't see eating at the or, or competing with the darker pigmented biofilm and um you know not everybody's worried about biofilm but it's been a problem here in dc where we've got all these monumental marble buildings where it becomes really obvious you may know the other famous example uh the jefferson which just did all that uh laser and steam cleaning and we we i say we but really i can't again take credit for this um but the cemetery had been working with Judy and with uh, the Jefferson Memorial and doing comparative studies. So there's lots of good research to come out in the future. Um, and now I think I've talked past the original question. <laughs> we don't really know how long it takes is what I'm gonna be honest about. We know it takes a long time, but it, I found it varies based on the site conditions. Uh, is it high, is it low, is it sunny, is it shady? Um, you know, real world is complicated. And um, in the sunny spots, it seems to work faster. I think because it's doing that sunblock thing where it's shadier, seems to be a little slower. Um, we know it takes at least a couple months to see results and to get the whole scale cleaning effect, it really has taken the full year. Um, and the tomb, it, it really did take close to two. Um, so it's, it's not a fast process. And also we designed it for marble, white marble. Um, this is zinc oxide in solution. It, uh, depending on your concentration, which we still haven't necessarily studied how high or how low a concentration is really most effective. Um, but uh, it's in solution and it basically looks like a, uh, a, a little bit like a whitewash, a lime, lime wash, um, it's milky colored. So it's been really good for marble. It does, it changes the tone of the marble a little bit, the hue, but um, maybe not so great on buildings that aren't white marble. What is the binder for the zinc oxide particles? Uh, the way we've been doing it, we just suspend the zinc oxide in water. 
sometimes we add a little ethanol to help um, help keep the solution suspended. But really, it, it's just we kept it simple, zinc and water. And we kept it really simple when we expanded it for contractors. Um, we did not make it complicated. Great. Um, someone in the chat mentioned that there's a published research on the use of zinc oxide nanoparticles by scientists in India and Ethiopia. So if anyone mm -hmm. is interested, more interested in the, the zinc oxide. Um, lots of compliments on your, your presentation. Oh, Another nice. question, totally uh, different from the zinc oxide. Uh, what is your, what has your interaction with veterans families and other visitors been like during these conservation projects? Um, it's been an interesting time. I think generally positive. Uh, I think anybody who's been a, a field preservationist, conservator, um, especially working on monuments, people are generally very kind. They'll thank you for what you're doing and you go, you don't need to, I'm getting paid. <laughs> it's my job. <laughs> um, generally, people are very kind. Um, uh, because of my position, I don't have to interact with the families directly that often, um, but it, it does happen. Um, yeah, I think mostly people are just thankful to see these symbols, these these things that are so emotionally tied to cared for, and um, and generally, people are very complimentary. That's great. What um is how many military versus civilian do you work with at the at the cemetery? Is most of the staff there civilian um, besides the the soldiers that are guarding the the tomb? Um, so I will butcher this and I, I, I would hate to get this wrong. I don't know the exact ratio. I remember being told we were around 220, 230, but that's an old number uh, of staff full time. Um, it's an interesting place. There's, so it's, it's, the staff is slowly growing. Um, it is a, a pretty good, I, I think we're predominantly civilian, though a lot of those civilians are veterans. Um, I don't know the exact percentages. It is a mix, um, but we probably have a much higher ratio of veterans than you would find at, at some other agencies and other sites. Um, and then it's interesting also because we have a lot of contractors on site uh, supporting the staff because we have huge, huge landscaping and horticulture contracts. Um, and there's just always construction going on. So it's, it's a very full and very busy site. That's great. I think that is all the questions we have at the moment. Um, and I think we're over our time, but that was so fascinating. Thank you so much, Palin. Thank you all. It was really an honor to speak with y'all. Great. Well, thanks everyone for joining us um, this evening and we hope you have a good evening. <laughs>